The question to lead this off, do you want a Copilot Plus PC? This episode of Sun Gadget Guy is brought to you by viewers like you. The amazing support of my patrons helping keep the lights on here in the Gadget Lab. More info on those awesome nerds later in the video. I reached out recently to the folks at Acer as I genuinely haven't handled an Acer in a couple of years. And they sent this over, the Swift Go 14 for me to take on a test drive. And the timing on this is kind of funny given all the news we've gotten about new laptops and Microsoft's ambitions for the AI. The Swift Go was refreshed earlier this year, moving from an Intel Core i7 to the newer Core Ultra 7 155H. We've seen reviews on that for a couple months now, and Acer sent over a good mid-spec model with 16 gigs of RAM and a one terabyte SSD, but with the 1920 by 1200 LCD display running at 60 Hertz. Immediately a little confusion, Acer's pricing on their website is kind of funny as the OLED version with one terabyte of storage is listed at the same price as the lower resolution LCD with 512 gigs of storage. But shopping around the interwebs, you can find solid pricing for a configuration like this one, making it one of the more affordable options with this level of performance. The Core Ultra 7 is no slouch, and the big upgrade generation over generation is the move to Intel Arc graphics, and we'll talk about that more in just a bit. The design is simple and sleek if a touch deceiving in thinness. I mean, we're all going for the slimmest angled wedge that we can make. So while the outer edges of the laptop come to a finer point, there's, there's a bit more chassis under the keyboard. Great collection of ports though, USB-A on both sides, supporting USB 3.2, two USB-C supporting USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4, micro SD, 3.5 millimeter headset, and a full-sized HDMI. You can quickly go from thin and light portable machine to a multi-monitor desktop setup. Two minor wishes, Ethernet is always handy, though I understand why it's included less and less these days, but I wish there was a USB-C on the other side, as you can't always account for where you're working if you can keep accessories on that side. Backlit keys with nice key travel and a good sound to them. They remind me a little of the great keyboard on my Pixelbook Go. The touchpad is nice and large, has a good feel to it too. It's called the Ocean Glass Trackpad and it's responsive, it supports Windows Gesture as well. I think we're decently past that era of Windows laptops where we just had to accept terrible trackpads. Plus, I just hate clicking into a trackpad when touch taps work quieter. If I just kept playing trackpad clicks randomly throughout this video, it would get distracting and annoying. That's what you sound like when you use a trackpad in an office environment. On top of the fact that we do have a touchscreen, so some actions can be controlled directly through the display. Sometimes a tablet-y pinch and zoom just makes more sense than buttons or trackpad controls. Now the screen here is decently bright, probably won't take my top pick for outdoor viewability, the LCD is listed as having 100% sRGB coverage, and it is a nice looking screen. I spend so much time with uh, portable monitors and inexpensive portable displays, you can kind of see those differences in a slightly more expensive LCD. I like OLEDs, but a good LCD is still a really good screen. A bigger part of my personal preference isn't necessarily the screen technology, I'm just a bit spoiled by higher refresh rate displays, and on this configuration, it would have been nice to have at least 90 hertz, given the performance and price. 60 hertz is fine, but it's just fine. The Swift has Windows 11 Home on it and a fair amount of value added software from Acer and their partners. And I, I think it's annoying when you fire up a new PC and you see those recommendations for Booking.com and Forge of Empires and Spotify, Grammarly, Luminar. The worst one on this setup was Dropbox, splashing multiple nag screens and pop-ups for a one-time only promotion that was lame. Acer includes a system management app with a cute little smartphone style quick panel. I've always wondered how many people use those kinds of features when you're using an actual true multitasking desktop operating system. Like they make sense on phones and tablets, but when we have a bottom dock that you can already configure for your most used applications, I, drop me a comment down below. Do you use a quick panel like this on your laptop? And maybe let me know what am I missing? But getting into the performance, it's pretty good. 
Now, I'm getting very excited about ARM PCs and the next generation of Copilot Plus machines. We had this short window of AI PCs that are already being marketed like they're obsolete. The CPU and GPU performance here would beg to differ. Running a few of my basic tests, I don't run hardcore scientific laboratory benchmarks. We've got Geekbench scores that hang really well with Ryzen 7 and last generation Core i9s. The big leap here is on the GPU front where this is noticeably more powerful than a last generation Intel integrated GPU and now trades blows great against AMD's Radeon integrated graphics. It's interesting to me that Intel still kind of struggles with browser and compression tests though. We saw the new Qualcomm ARM chip competing against another laptop with a Core Ultra 7 155H and in browser bench, it lost by a sizable margin. I saw similar results on the Acer running the same chip. Ditto my silly little RAR benchmark where right now AMD is beating Intel machines pretty handily. And getting into a little content creation rendering a one minute 4K video project in DaVinci Resolve, the Intel part was slower in a CPU render against an older AMD 7735HS, but the GPU render managed to beat the new AMD 8945HS by more than 10%. Though Acer isn't claiming this is a gaming machine with a 60 hertz screen, but Arc is easily overkill for smaller indie titles, platformers, brawlers, and any games that take on that older console or arcadey look. I still like showing off Tetris Effect because we like to see higher and higher graphic settings, but we don't want to slip a single frame as we're sliding those blocks around. Checking out Control is interesting right now because this is a game Qualcomm is showing off running at around 30 frames per second at 1080p with medium graphic settings. Now, Arc graphics are getting us pretty close to that performance too. And doing a little more than running around though, we do see some frame dips as we send more debris up just in this space right here. Hellblade sees some beautiful quality improvements when using some kind of scaling tech like FSR. It's not difficult getting that game to play at a consistent 30 frames per second, but it seems like we can bump up the quality a little higher over the integrated Radeon graphics on last generation AMD chips. And Robocop, loves this kind of scaling like FSR. I can't get the frame rate as high here as I could on the Radeon, but it looks really good and it stays comfortably above 30 frames per second in combat. That last game, Robocop, that's a nice improvement to see where I recently tested an older 12th gen Core i9 and the integrated graphics there could not run Robocop at all because of issues with DirectX support. Moving forward, Arc graphics seem to include all the necessary little bits for Unreal Engine 5 support. I'm really happy to see that. What we can't quite escape though is the performance per watt of x86 machines powered by both Intel and AMD chips. The Core Ultra 7 with a funny named Tetra Deca Core configuration is a better step than I was expecting after using generations of Core i7s and i9s. Six performance cores and eight efficiency cores. There's less fan presence than previous Intel powered laptops. It hasn't kicked on at all while I'm just holding it here with basically nothing running on it. You'll still regularly hear the fan spin up while you're doing basic stuff and the machine will get louder as you tax the CPU and GPU, but low level browsing, it's a lot quieter than it used to be. Or just running a simple video streaming test, an hour of 1080p video with the display around 200 lux, only drained about 7% of the battery. The fans almost completely spun down while I was watching, which we can't always say has been the case for older Intel systems. Acer lists this as up to a 12 and a half hour runtime, but of course that's with a mix of activities, a lot of lower performance activities, and with the screen brightness reduced. These are good-ish numbers, and you certainly won't feel the same pressing battery anxiety when you're out and about, but if you run the system a little harder, you'll need to look for an outlet to charge up before you make it to the end of the day. Unfortunately, one of the critical differences of an Intel system versus a Mac or one of these upcoming Qualcomm machines, the performance is still going to dip a little when you unplug by a much less severe margin than we've seen in the past, but CPU rendering speeds in Resolve 
took a small hit. Geekbench scores. Also, we saw a small reduction. And when we plug in as the battery is charging and the whole system is getting warmer, you're gonna hear the fans spin up a lot more. Like while I was installing games from Steam while it was plugged in, the fans were peaking and it sounded like a jet engine about to take off. Quick test of the uh, webcam that's built into the upper bezel here on the Acer Swift 14. Again, I don't have a script. I'm just kind of rambling through this. Laptop cameras have been covering in this odd 1080p tiny sensor space just for the functionality of having a webcam on your laptop. Acer has a 1440p camera on their laptop, which is, again, that's a little different. That's kind of interesting. This is kind of the setup if you just had a bedroom. Obviously, I've just got top-down lighting, and you can see how kind of dark this looks. If you're the type of person, though, who likes to spruce up their video calls with some kind of extra lighting, a lamp, a ring light, or an LED panel, your view would look a little bit more like this, and I think that helps clean up the image in the presentation, and, and it looks a little nicer. I know not all of us are trying to work some kind of streamer production setup for taking a meeting for work, but just that that difference you know what this is going to look like compared against just normal top down or cozier bedroom lighting something like that i think we've got enough of a sample here let's get back to the rest of the video and closing out the performance conversation this pc does have an mpu on board and that's really difficult to test in real world applications this whole era of windows laptops was hyped as the beginning of the ai pc and then microsoft threw intel and amd under the bus. The newest, flashiest AI capabilities coming to Windows 11 are only coming to machines with significantly more powerful MPUs. Now, I like to demo something simple, like the Windows Photo app and the new generative erase feature from Microsoft. Comparing some basic image editing across my older Windows on ARM tablet and a newer AMD APU, the Intel machine hangs in there with fast erasing. It's a great option to show off some consumer-style AI editing. But that's where we run into the funny bit of this entire generation of hardware. New features like Windows Recall have been met with a lot of skepticism or scrutiny, and consumers haven't really jumped on the AI bandwagon like these massive data corporations might have hoped. So the manufacturers are changing everything up to keep their investors happy and promote all this AI stuff, and that's casting a shadow over the current generation of Intel and AMD kit that's performing really well. We're seeing prices on these machines slide faster than I was expecting. So they won't get the full Copilot Plus branding, but for the actual practical stuff that matters, the day-to-day -day computing, it might be a great time to shop a new system, a powerful system, that can still handle some of the fun AI stuff. This was the AI PC until Qualcomm started showing off the new X Elite chip. It's far from obsolete, even with Microsoft trying to push Copilot harder and harder. Generally looking at system configurations sliding under $1,000, it's exciting competition to watch. Even though we're likely to see some component prices like RAM and SSDs on the rise, the total system prices on laptops and mini PCs probably gonna need to stay a bit leaner to compete with newer ARM PCs that are hitting the market. And of course, the inevitable refresh we'll see from Intel and AMD probably early next year, so their systems can also be Copilot Plus 2. It's maybe not the best portable computer that I've ever used, especially when you compare it to the battery life on a MacBook, but it's a fantastic thin, light, portable, mobile desktop kind of experience. Great for a little light work when you're on the battery and then you plug it in if you need more horsepower. This is a little slice, a little window where our dollar might stretch a bit farther. That's kind of unique in tech land right now. But this was a good machine for me to check up on as it sets a great baseline of performance, some expectations, and now a performance per dollar against the new Qualcomm powered laptops coming out soon. What I'm personally investing in for a new Microsoft Surface laptop, more than twice the price of what Acer is selling here. And when I start running tests on new Qualcomm chips and comparing against Intel and AMD, the first folks who get to see that coverage are my awesome patrons. I greatly appreciate everyone who supports their, their favorite channels, shares and subscribes, 
But if you have the means, please consider checking out the community at patreon.com slash some gadget guy. Early access, 4K videos, production diaries, behind the scenes, the private discord, and they're just genuinely a great group of geeks to hang out with. Once again, patreon.com slash some gadget guy. A huge thank you from the bottom of my heart as those folks are helping to keep the lights on here in the gadget lab. Now, you know where you can find me around the rest of the internet at some gadget guy, basically everywhere, but these days spending a bit more time on the Mastodons, a lot less so on the Facebooks or the Instagrams, definitely not on the Twitters, and I will catch you all on the next review.